Tiffany tour uh, as we go around Manhattan. Uh, a couple things I want to talk about safety. You're welcome to move around the boat. We're going to ask that you hold on to something as the boat goes because when another boat goes by us, we're going to rock a little bit, right? So one hand for yourself one hand for the ship or one hand for your drink because that's more important so if you hold on to your drinks there make sure you hold on to the table uh we do have two restrooms on board since we're talking about drinks uh it's right down the steps up forward so hold on to the handrails if you need to use the restroom you need to walk up these steps and down there you're welcome to move around the boat even go outside it's really nice out today so especially when we get up in the east and harlem rivers we're gonna ask that you hold the handrails as you go out um but we're gonna have a great trip Safety equipment. So we do have life jackets located underneath the seats. We don't anticipate using them, but it's a good thing to know where they are. We have an awesome crew today. We got an awesome uh, tour guide, Doug, who's going to be talking about what you guys are going to be learning today. We got a great service staff. We got um, we got Christian and we've got uh, uh, Sean. So if you need anything, feel free to ask. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic over to Doug. Thanks. Thank you, Captain Aaron. Welcome aboard everyone, my name is Doug Fox. I look forward to conducting this architecture and climate change boat tour as we circumnavigate the island of Manhattan on this spectacular day. And as soon as we head out into the Hudson River, we're gonna head south toward lower Manhattan, the harbor, then up the East River, Harlem River, wrap around the northern tip and come back here. This tour is billed as an, Arch an AIA New York, American Institute of Architects New York chapter architecture and climate change tour and I'm curious before we get started how many folks are primarily here for climate change few handful how many folks are here primarily for the architecture wow how do you like that and how many people don't want to hear anything I say during the narration and just want to sit back and look at the wonderful skyline I hope everyone's going to be gracious and keep your hands down. Thank you for being so generous to me. I really appreciate that. So it's always helpful to know what the balance is, that I will definitely cover some important climate change topics. This is today the 10th anniversary of Superstorm Sandy, and that superstorm caused tremendous damage here in New York City, and there's been a huge response in the aftermath in terms of how we move forward, creating a more resilient shoreline, protecting us from future inundations, from storm surges, as well as rising sea levels, and how we also cope with these massive inundations, cloud bursts that release huge amounts of rain in New York City in such quantities that we don't really have the capacity. <laughs> some wonderful architecture in the city so it would be a mix of architecture highlights and climate change I'll walk around and don't hesitate to ask any questions you have on any front architecture climate change urban planning history and other topics and I'll do my best to answer your questions in terms of my background I'm a member of the American Institute of Architects in New York chapter there's a group of six of us who conduct these tours on a regular basis we started 13 years ago, and we've been working in partnership with Classic Harbor Line, who has these wonderful yachts, including the Manhattan One that we are on right now, that are styled after 1920 commuter yachts, and I've been doing these tours for 12 of the past 13 years. Definitely a good idea to open the windows, as you guys just have done. It is become super hot all of a sudden, so don't hesitate to open up the windows. Once we are in the Hudson River in just a few moments, feel free to stand up. You can go outside of the bow. It's an absolutely great day for doing that. You can also hear the narration outside as well. Please don't hesitate to complain about the sound levels. If you cannot hear clearly, we can adjust them both inside and outside. And in addition to hopefully having a wonderful time, we only have one request. And that is while inside the cabin, of course, enjoy your conversations. But if you could keep the sound level a bit on the low side in the cabin so that those who want to be able to hear very clearly the narration can do so, we really appreciate your help. You can have louder conversations outside. And if I happen to remind you about that a bit later, 
please don't take offense. I'm not trying to be obnoxious or interfere with conversations. I just want it to be a worthwhile experience for all. So thank you so much. It's great getting the cross breeze in here right now. Yeah, I don't think this side. That that side opens, but not that side. That side doesn't, right? And there went down three to the house the last time. I think we have 32, right? Two people came afterwards. So welcome everyone we back to the Manhattan the One. The I'll leave you back with Doug in a little bit, but today we're going to ride around Manhattan, see the entire island, starting here at Chelsea Piers, which is right now Pier 62 area. And we're gonna go downtown, all around the East River, up the East River, and then down the Hudson. It's going to be an epic journey all around. This is part of the AIA, part of the Classic Harbor Line, American Institute of Architects, New York Division, tour in honor and in remembrance of Superstorm Sandy. 10 years it has been since that terrible storm took over New York City. And now we're going to learn about the history of the architecture of New York City, the waterfront, and also the future and how they're building better sustainable architecture and ways to prevent um, any further damage from climate change. The guy today is part of the American Institute of Architects in New York, Doug Fox, expert tour guide, and he knows basically everything there is to know about New York City. I am Ariel. I run a show called Urbanist, where I explore cities all around the world, I explore significantly New York City. So if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. I'll leave you listening to Doug for most of the journey, and then later on, I'll answer any questions. Right now, we have Meg, Meg Park, who is part of the Classic Harbor Line. She'll be answering any questions via the comments. So feel free to ask Meg right now, moderator for this live stream, any comments. So let me show you, without further ado, the beautiful views and enjoy the tour here at Classic Harbor Line. If you want to join them in person, they run Thursdays throughout November and December. ClassicHarborLine.com. The world is known for many commissions, including the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain. That white color is actually made from rays on dust, called trick, and they allow sunlight to enter, but they reduce the amount of sun heat that enters the building. So it's one mechanism for reducing the use of fossil fuels here. And this building is the headquarters for Barry Diller and his IAC building, Barry Diller's the Internet and Media Mobile. He and his wife, Diane von Furstenberg, the fashion designer, who has her headquarters in the meatpacking district that we are coming up to right now, donated tens of millions of dollars to make the Highline a reality. They also financed this new pier for a quarter of a billion dollars. This captivating form, undulating in design, supported by those cylindrical concrete pilings up by those tulip-like designs that are essentially planters for the trees, shrubs, and flowers. It was designed by the British designer Thomas Heatherwick. On the left side, you can see a number of people sitting on the tiered wooden seating of the amphitheater, one of multiple performing art spaces here at the new Pier 55 or the Little Island. It opened just last year. It's been incredibly popular since it opened. And right along the shoreline, you'll notice there's a light gray stainless steel clad building, eight floors in height with an industrial character. On the left side, you have those tightly spaced slender vertical windows. This is the Whitney Museum of Art that opened here in 2015. They used to be on the east side of Manhattan. This new home by Renzo Piano, the Italian architect who designed the last skyscraper for the New York Times, which is in Times Square. And the Whitney Museum here was actually under construction when Superstorm Sandy struck exactly 10 years ago. They were fortunate they weren't too far along in the process of construction because they had followed the guidelines of FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. They have the flood map 
and it makes predictions essentially about how high flood waters will reach. Those predictions were wrong. And the Whitney had followed those guidelines, had elevated the lobby, but it wasn't high enough. So they completely changed their game plan. They lifted the lobby another five or six feet. The cavernous basement, which was completely flooded by storm surge water when standing constructed, they decided to never house any galleys, never house any artwork. And actually, they never have artwork on the first five floors as well. They do not want to take risks. Just look at the seawall right along that edge, that stone seawall. That is no match. You look how low that is. That's no match for the 10 feet storm surge above the high tide mark of sanding. So a lot of the galleries were inundated and there was definitely artwork lost as a result of that superstorm. If we turn to our right, we have Hobo in New Jersey. We're coming up to the Erie Line of Walk. Erie Line of Walk. Can't do it on a Saturday morning. No, I've said it a thousand times. Erie, Lackawanna Railroad Terminal with its clock tower. And this terminal in Hoboken, Hoboken is known as the Mile Square City. It's bigger than that. It is one of the most low-lying cities in the United States, just after Miami Beach in Florida. They were completely inundated with water, and they have also taken measures to help ensure that in the future that they are protected and more resilient from inundations, both from sea and from cloudbursts, huge rainstorms, and I'll be talking about a number of those strategies as we proceed. If you go a little further along the shoreline of New Jersey in the direction we're heading, hugging the shoreline is a white sculptural bust depicting a young woman putting her index finger to her mouth asking us to be quiet and contemplate the waterways of New York and New Jersey. That's called Water's Soul. It's a design by a Barcelona, Spain artist, Jauma Plensa, just dedicated last year. Alternatively, she may be telling New Yorkers across the Hudson just to shut up and knock off the ruckus. And as we turn back to Manhattan, if you look ahead of us on the Manhattan side, some of you will have your views blocked for just a moment. You'll notice a tall, slender, glass-clad tower of few blocks inland. Everyone refers to this as the Jenga Tower or Jenga Block Tower because you'll notice, especially on the upper floors, the floors project or cantilever out in different directions. It's as if a child has stacked those Jenga plane blocks in an odd configuration. That is 56 Leonard Street in the Tribeca neighborhood, a luxury residential tower by a Swiss architectural firm, Erzog and de Veron. Wow, so yeah, right down there we see the Jenga Tower. Right next to it we have the windowless building, skyscraper of New York City. The AT&T Long Lines building, which is frequently missed by people passing through. Yep, 500 feet tall. On our left-hand no side, windows. the end of a slender pier, you'll notice that lightish brown or tan brick structure cap with dark brown. That is one of the four ventilation towers for the Holland Tunnel. Two on each side. The Holland Tunnel opened in 1927 for automobile and traffic. And these towers were the first implementation ever of a mechanical ventilation system for a tunnel that pulled out the carbon monoxide from below to improve the air source. If you've ever been on the, in the Holland Tunnel, you might question that because the air always feels uh, completely unacceptable, but it would otherwise be a lot worse. So each of these ventilation towers incorporate huge fans that are pulling that carbon dioxide out. In a moment, as we go just a tad further south, in a moment, you can see the inland ventilation tower on the Manhattan side. And immediately in front of that inland ventilation tower, there's a light concrete sculptural-like shape. That's one of my favorite recent 
municipal works of infrastructure, that is a salt storage shed, as in the salt that is used by New York City garbage trucks to sprinkle the streets with for de-icing purposes is stored there. And that external design with its faceted as a multi-sided shape is supposed to look like a sugar, not a sugar, it's supposed to look like a salt crystal shape as in the external design reflects the internal material that is stored there. That is by a New York architect, Richard Dackner, who I'll be talking much more about. And on the Harlem River, we'll be able to see an example of a passive house building that he designed. Passive house is one of the green or sustainability certifications. The salt shed is now behind us, immediately in front of that inland ventilation tower. Is that clear? Great. You'll notice as we reach lower Manhattan, there's a jut of land that comes out towards us in the Hudson River. And if we look immediately left, Tribeca is further inland. This landmass that is closer to us is Battery Park City. In the late 1960s, when they were excavating the base of the original World Trade Center, they took that excavation material, dumped it into the Hudson River, over where the Working Harbor Piers used to be located. Those piers no longer needed because containerization was transforming how goods were shipped around the world, and we needed a lot of upland space for container ports today, mostly in New Jersey, as we'll see, and they created this 92-acre expanse of land, primarily residential, with a central office district. I just mentioned the Passive House Green Certification System for buildings, but the most popular one is called LEED. LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It's a program of the U.S. Green Building Council. There are over 100,000 buildings in the world that have that green certification. And essentially it means a building reduces its use of energy, reduces its use of water, it produces less garbage, it's often closer to public transportation, so people rely less on automobiles. And I'll show you one example of a multi-family home building that is LEED certified right along the shoreline you'll notice two side-by-side -side orange brick buildings. The one on the right on the roof line has purple photovoltaic panels. That is the solar, and those photovoltaic panels capture sunlight converting into electricity to reduce the carbon footprint or reduce the use of fossil fuels in that building. They have many other green technologies that can even capture wastewater from sinks and dishwashers and filter that water and then use it for irrigation purposes in the for landscaping adjacent to that solar building. And if we look up, you can see the soaring glass clad One World Trade Center, part of the redevelopment of the World Trade Center site in the aftermath of the terrorist attack of September 11, 2000 and one now 21 years ago. Today there are three glass-clad office buildings at the new or the newly rebuilt World Trade Center. One World Trade Center is an obelisk in shape, wider at the base and then narrows as it reaches the rooftop, officially the tallest building in the United States, not because of its roof line. There's a series of new pencil-thin, super tall towers in Midtown that have roof lines higher than the roof line here. But this mass that crowns it of 408 feet is considered to be an integral part of the design of the tower, thus part of its height. Not a lot of people buy that, including myself, but that's more or less the law of the land. So the tip reaches 1,776 feet in honor of the year 1776 and the founding of the United States. Those three glass towers wrap around the preserve of the World Trade Center of the original Twin Towers that are now the heart of the 9-11 Memorial with those cascading sheets of water and the bronze nameplates with the almost 3,000 people who died on 9-11.
if you've been to the 9-11 memorial out of view from here on the water, you may have seen these silvery cylindrical bollards along the perimeter of the 9-11 memorial. Those are security bollards to protect cars from entering the 9-11 memorial. They've actually turned it into a resiliency measure as well. If, they, if a storm is coming, they can take these silvery steel log-like structures and place them, stack them one on top of another to create a flood wall that will protect the World Trade Center site the next time we have a superstorm or hurricane that strikes the city. Because just like the Whitney Museum, that cavernous uh, bathtub foundation was inundated with water when Superstorm Sandy struck. So right there is our guy, Doug Fox of the AIANY, American Institute of Architects. He's an allied member. And right now we are at the Manhattan Yacht on Classic Harbor Line, seeing the views of downtown Manhattan, the financial district, One World Trade Center right there in the center, Battery Park City. And this is in remembrance of the 10 year anniversary of Superstorm Sandy. And we're talking also about sustainable architecture that is being built all around the waterfront. So you just mentioned earlier the ballards uh, along the waterfront as well. I'm Ariel. I run the show Urbanist Exploring Cities on YouTube. And on TikTok, I'm Ariel Vieira, which is my last name. And we have Meg, who's part of the Classic Harbor Line. And she'll be answering any questions in the comments, or I will. So feel free to ask anything. Right now we're seeing views and everyone slam that like button, that heart button in the bottom and then share this live video right now on Instagram with anyone who might be interested in architecture, New York City, or just generally loves good views. If you look at the skyline of Lower Manhattan, so if you look up, there's a green, green pyramid-shaped rooftop of, for 40 Wall Street, the Bank of Manhattan building, one of the famous Art Deco towers from 1930. Along the shoreline of Battery Park City, we just passed a small masonry clad building hugging the shoreline. It has a six level rooftop, each level steps inward. That is the Museum of Jewish Heritage. And directly across from us, that white pier with the slender clock towers, Pier A, the oldest pier on the island of Manhattan, now a beer hall and oyster bar. But I think it hasn't opened since the pandemic started. Keep walking by, I don't think I've seen any activity there recently. Really a spectacular day, plus the leaves are changing, and it's actually too cold down in the valley, so we couldn't get it better than it is. We are in the upper bay of the New York and New Jersey Harbor. Some wet, small waves out here, plus we'll get hit by the wakes of other boats. So just be careful as you walk about and watch your precious drinks as well. <laughs> so yeah, drinks are being served here. Also a little bit lighter bites later on. There's uh, wine included, soft drinks too. I think even coffee. Ooh, I think they're drinking Bloody Marys maybe. And hello Daisy, hello Jules, hello Claire, hello Meg, Mika, uh, Light Travel says uh, this is an awesome clear day for a sale. Indeed it is. Hello Captain Joy, Captain Josh, welcome. Guys, nice to see you here. Welcome everyone. Let me know where you're watching from. I'm Ariel. I'm from originally from Queens, New York. I'm so excited to be seeing all of New York City all around. It's amazing. We're starting to see Governor's Island down there. Uh, we see Brooklyn down there, the downtown Brooklyn skyline now with the super tall skyscraper right over there. If I'm correct, it's called the Brooklyn Tower. Susie's watching from Bushwick, Brooklyn. Nice to see you here, Susie. Anthony, nice. We got a lot of urbanists tuning in as well. 
you're enjoying this, slam that heart button. Right down there, we're also seeing the Staten Island Ferry. On our Ferry. right hand side is Ellis Island. Ellis Island was a major immigrant depot. 12 million immigrants were processed here between the early 1890s and 1954 when the facility closed down. As part of the centennial restoration of the Statue of Liberty, a restoration took place here of the main immigrant immigration depot building the largest structure on the island, red brick, light limestone trim, and those four fancy tall towers with the green onion domes and spires. When completed in 1990, it opened up as the Immigrant Museum that recreates the experience of the immigrants who arrived here, especially in the first two decades of the 20th century. On the left side of the island, where you see that collection, of smaller, recently refurbished buildings. That's where the Immigrant Hospital and Quarantine Center were located. Some of those buildings are slowly opening up as part of expanded historic interpretation centers. Once again, as we look at that seawall, let's go outside. When, when Superstorm Sandy struck, the entire island was damaged. And back then, electrical equipment, other building systems were in the basement. The salt water came in and just destroyed everything. It was this island, Ellis Island, and the museum were closed for a year. It took that long to make repairs, and they fortified the seawall. They expect those those seawalls to be breached, but what they have done is moved up all those building systems to higher floors, so we won't have the same level of damage in the future. Anybody know which state Ellis Island belongs to? New Jersey or New York? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Anybody want to say New York? Well, you're both right. The original landmass where Ellis Island, where the Ellis, I'm going to start over, where the immigrant depot is located, that's the original three acres of land of the island. Everything else is landfill. So that original acreage belongs to New York, the landfill belongs to New Jersey. We are approaching one of the most famous sites in the United States, the Statue of Liberty, Liberty Enlightening the World, a gift from the French to the Americans dedicated in 1886. If you're looking at Lady Liberty, then look all the way to the right side of the island, you can see an American flag fluttering in the wind. Just to the right of that, there's a building with a green grass rooftop that slopes down to ground level. That is the new Statue of Liberty Museum that opened up just two years ago, uh, designed by the architectural firm FX Collaborative. Now all visitors to the island can access an exhibit about the history of the Statue of Liberty. It used to be you had to have pedestal tickets. The pedestal is the granite base on which Lady Liberty rests. Turning back to Lady Liberty herself, it was the sculptor, French sculptor, Frederica Gus Bartholdi, who came to the New York Harbor scouting out a location for his planned monumental work. When he looked at Bedloe Island today is Liberty Island, he would have seen a fort at the base as we see. That star-shaped fort at the lowest level is Fort Wood. It was built for the War of 1812. The federal government gave Bartholdi the go-ahead. He returned to Paris and start the design process. Lady Liberty is made of 300 sheets of copper, each about the thickness of two U.S. copper pennies, wow. incredibly thin. She definitely had the brown copper color early on, but through the process of oxidation, it transformed to the green patina that we have today. If you've ever had crown tickets, the crown of the 25 cutouts that wrap around her forehead, you would have walked up a narrow spiral staircase up to her crown, and you would have been inside that virtual truck tower built by Jersey. 
Jersey and Bayonne, New Jersey. You can see one of the large container ports, the local container terminal. A little farther along in Bayonne, New Jersey, you can see a cruise ship dock in Liberty Port. And continuing our plan of the Upper Bay, the Verrazano Narrows, extension bridge connecting Staten Island on the right and Brooklyn on the left. Some of you may heard, have heard of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers' plan for protecting the harbor from future storm surges. And one of the plans was to build an in-water storm surge barrier right along the location of where the Verrazano Narrow Suspension Bridge is located. would have a series of gates that would only be closed if we were expecting expecting a massive storm surge. The latest plan by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers decided not to go ahead with that recommendation. They're going to design smaller in-water gates at the entranceways to canals, tributaries, and smaller rivers, and couple that with seawalls, shoreline protection in the form of flood walls that will protect different neighborhoods from rising sea levels and storm surges in the future. I will show a bit later, not too long, along the East River, some of those construction projects that are taking place right now. So as uh, Doug was mentioning, right now we are seeing Brooklyn on our right here, left. Right side on the Brooklyn side, if you're viewing our quote at the clock with the uh, about 2 o'clock, now almost 3 o'clock, off to our right is Sunset Park, Brooklyn. That is where they will soon be constructing large-scale wind turbines that are going to be put out in the Atlantic Ocean, part of an ambitious project of New York State to produce much more renewable energy from, in this case, wind turbines. Hello, Bob. Nice to see you here. Bob says it's a great way to see the city and appreciate the islands. Yes, it is indeed. You know, you truly get a unique perspective of New York when you take a cruise line like this, a uh, sightseeing cruise, like classic Harbor Line. You really do get a sense of New York and how it is composed of islands. Because right now, Brooklyn right is also an island, side, part of island, a of nice Long Island. Close up view of Governor's Island, a wonderful New York City park that opened in 2004. I also come out here about once a year or so with my family. You can bike around the two-mile perimeter, the gourmet food truck, and many other offerings and events throughout the year. This park was reconfigured and redesigned just before Superstorm Sandy struck. These new hills are human engineered, and they're strategically placed on the southern end of the island closest to the Atlantic Ocean, so they would be a protective barrier for storm surges that strike the New York, New York City, New Jersey area in the years to come. Right in front of the hill, you see that brown wood vessel-like structure. That is a new art installation that was just installed here about two or three weeks ago. It's called Moving Chains. It's supposed to evoke a ship carrying captured slaves from Africa mm. and bring heat and being brought here to the United States by a conceptual artist, Charles Gaines. And you can see on the slender side at the top, there are these silvery chains. They're each 1,600 pounds. They're all moving, but the central one, which is ground, is moving slightly faster and as if this slave ship is being carried on the wavy water and the chain support the cruelty, the cruelty of slavery and how the slaves were chained as they were brought here to the new world. The tent, a question about the tent, a odd juxtaposition with that art installation and those tents are part of a glamping experience, a combination of glamour and camping. So if you're willing to spend $400 or more <laughs> per night, you can stay in those tents overnight and take in the spectacular views. Oh, wow. 
So right here we're looking at Governor's Island, which used to be a military base for a good chunk of its history. And here we're seeing the former military building, well, some of it. Northern end still. of the island where we see these brown brick buildings and a handful of white cupolas crowning these towers. These structures were built by the U.S. Army. This was a U.S. Army base from the early 1800s to the 1960s when it was closed down. So they built barracks buildings, homes for the commanding officers. And on this corner of the island, you'll notice this red sandstone circular fort with the three tiers and those square-shaped openings intended for cannons to be able to project cannonballs out into the harbor. Just like Fort Wood at the base of the Statue of Liberty, this castle, Williams, was constructed to thwart a British invasion of the harbor during the War of 1812. That invasion never materialized, so none of these forts was ever put to the test. DT Prop says Charles Gaines saw his works at Dia Beacon. Oh, that's so awesome. That's amazing to hear. Uh, and Susie says, I've never been to Governor's Island. Highly recommend it. It's accessible via ferry, or you can take a classic carbon line and see it from the waterfront. So, this was a prison, a military prison for a while, as uh, Doug was mentioning. Astonishing. A view. question about a off white structure on our immediate right, octagonal in shape, and the slender vertical split. Is that what you're asking about? That is, so I haven't mentioned it, that is a ventilation tower. We saw the Holland Tunnel ventilation tower. That's the ventilation tower for the Brooklyn Battery uh, Tunnel. Technically the Hugh Carey Tunnel, but who would call it that? <laughs> Let me show you a little bit more of the ship. Bathrooms are here as well, downstairs, which is nice. Why is it called Governor's Island? It's full bar. It's called Governor's Island because when New York City was a British royal colony, the royal governors lived on the island. Can't ask more questions. Of course you can ask more questions. That only about one or two people, caretakers, live there. Otherwise, no one lives there yet. But there could be changes among other developments. There could be soon a new climate change center and there could be an academic offering here as well, and that might include housing. We have a ways to go before we find out what happens on that front. Do I move around too much for you? When you're no, alone? no, not at all, because luckily the speaker is on everywhere, so okay. we can hear you everywhere. So if you need something specific, just let me know. Okay, definitely, yeah. Usually I try to ignore you and just do my normal thing. Yeah. But if you want me to, I will. If anyone asks a question, I'll ask for them uh, to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. On our left-hand side, you'll notice two side-by-side -side ferry terminals. On the left is the newer Whitehall ferry terminal. You'll notice those photovoltaic panels up top. Those are for the Bright Barn Staten Island ferries that go back and forth on a 25-minute journey. Manhattan and Staten Island, one of the boroughs of New York City. On the right side is a much older ferry terminal, the Battery Maritime Building, featuring the pink stucco lining of those arch bays, mostly in hues of green and purple, made of wrought iron and cast iron. And if you want to grab a ferry to visit Governor's Island, that is where you do that and make the quick trip across the channel. So right over here, we're starting to see Governor's Island Ferry stop. Right next door is the Staten Island Ferry. If you have any questions for Doug or myself, feel free to ask. Hello, Alfine. Hello, Montague, Tracy, Susie. 
Uh, Cindy, nice to see you here. Sylvia, Judith, Andrea, welcome everyone. Share this video with anyone you think would love architecture or New York on this beautiful day right over here. We are now leaves are East River. We have Brooklyn on our right and Pat on our left hand side. And Captain Aaron will give us a very close up view of the famous Wall Street in just a moment. Plus we can see this helicopter about to land on our left with the heliport. Wall Street in the financial district has surprisingly very narrow streets and that layout in part was put in, in place by the Dutch when this was a Dutch colony of New Amsterdam and oddly never transformed that much. So if you're on the bow of the boat right now outside, you're beginning to look down Wall Street. Wall Street is where this white and blue ferry, a New York City ferry is pulling out. And so I'm beginning to look down Wall Street right now. You'll notice it's very narrow, slightly curved to the left. At the very end, based on lighting conditions, we may get a quick, quick glimpse of the famous Trinity Church, the dark brownstone church with a tall slender spire that is at the foot of Wall Street and Broadway. The Dutch colony of New Amsterdam started in 1625. That's only three years away from the 400th anniversary of that colony. We're going to hit a wake off our right side in just a moment. Captain Aaron is going to turn a bit into it to minimize some of the rocking back and forth. Exactly. Pronounce Jose, you love these yachts, you've been twice, so I'm so glad. Uh, Doug, one question that a lot of people are asking, why is the FDR purple? Because people, they painted a small portion of it purple and then people liked it. Yeah. And oddly, the municipal government responded favorably to that and actually continued to build, paint the underbelly purple. Oh, fascinating. Okay. It doesn't usually happen. You yeah. don't think of government as being sponsored. Right. On our left hand side, South Street Seaport area, we can see some historic ships of the South Street Seaport Museum, including that three-masted waiver tree, and the new Pier 17 on our left-hand side with open performance space on the rooftop, which is a treat to visit, take the views. If you look inland and up, you can see that tall stainless steel residential building with a flat rooftop that has an undulating shape. That is another commission by Frank and Jerry, 8th Spruce Street. And directly behind it, the left, that green pyramid shape office building is the very famous Woolworth Tower. From 1913, the tallest building in the world. And in that Gothic revival style. And as we turn to the towers of the Brooklyn Bridge, you'll notice those pointed gothic arch openings embedded side by side in the refurbished granite towers. Plus, you can get a great picture of that iconic crisscrossing of the cables now or from the other side of the Brooklyn Bridge. Susie says I can see that building from my side. Oh, that's that amazing. of you right now, but a question about the gilded statue, civic fame crowning a wedding cake-like rooftop. That is the New York City Municipal Building from 1917. On our right-hand side is the very popular Dumbo neighborhood. 
an old industrial neighborhood that today has many residential offerings, cafes, restaurants, a great extension of Brooklyn Bridge, part along the shoreline. Constantly you see wedding pictures being taken here. And they're obliging by having wedding pictures being taken this moment along the shoreline. This Dumbo neighborhood was put on the map by a real estate developer, David Walentis, in the 1970s. And for the many locals on board, you'll remember that the 1970s were pretty bad economically for New York City. We almost went bankrupt. In the 1970s, David Walentis purchased 12 underutilized industrial buildings here, 2 million square feet of space at $6 a square foot. He made a lot of space available to artists and arts organizations, waited for the zoning to change, and in recent years, you can imagine many of those condos go for well over $1,000 a square foot. We are approaching this all steel Manhattan suspension bridge. Dumbo stands for down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass, so it's on both sides of Dumbo. And if you look at the residential building on the Brooklyn side just ahead of us, on the ground floor, you can just make out those cylindrical pilings that raise the rest of the building above the storm surges that are likely to hit in the future. That's a type of wet flood proofing, meaning they specifically designed the building to allow those storm surges to flood the ground floor and have lifted building systems and will force all the residences above. You'll notice, huh? Yes, there is quite a lot of marine life today in the harbor, throughout the New York City Harbor, partly because the waterways are so much cleaner than they used to be. And I'll talk about that cleaning of the waterways a bit later when we're traveling down the Hudson River. But it's a great development in New York City. Beautiful Lago says, great event, very informative. Indeed, it is super informative. Classic Harbor Line does this regularly, Thursdays, November and December. You can join this tour in person. Also, this will be available as a replay, so you can catch the replay later. Come in person and watch the replay of, uh, of this uh, tour, so you can uh, catch anything you might have missed, because when you're here in New York City, seeing these beautiful views, it's almost impossible to catch everything at the same time. So right down there, we're starting to see the Empire State Building. On the other side of Manhattan, right now we're in the East River, and I'm going to pop up a map so I can show you where we are right now. So right now we are moving along the East River, right around this area. Waterside Plaza, we start at Pier 62, Chelsea Piers, around down here. Classic Harbor Line, and we're moving all around, and we're going to go all around the island of Manhattan. That's a great question. A great question. What on earth are we looking at on the Manhattan side? I'm actually going to cover two things simultaneously. So on our left side is the Lower East Side of Manhattan, a major location where immigrants started to arrive in the 1880s. By 1900, this was one of the most densely packed neighborhoods 
in the United States with many immigrants living in five and six story walk up tenement buildings, very crowded, unhealthy living arrangements. These bridges of the Lower East River allowed people to move to Brooklyn and then the subway started in 1904, many people moving to North Manhattan, the Bronx, but being able to hop on the subway every weekday morning to come back downtown to their places of employment. What we see on our left are examples of urban renewal or smoke clearance programs popular in the mid 20th century, where they tore down the tenement buildings, displaced thousands, and constructed these towers in the park, these tall residential buildings on the open space primarily for middle class and lower income families. No question higher quality housing, but they tend to overlook the needs of the people who were displaced who used to live here who had a lot of trouble sometimes with finding suitable housing. And on our right side is the Navy Yard. It used to be a major shipbuilding facility for the US Navy. During World War II, 60,000 people were employed here in a shipbuilding capacity. And it's one of the rare instances where we've seen manufacturing coming back in a range of industries, including sustainable, over the past few years, along with the industry city a little further south on the Brooklyn side. On our immediate left, still on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, you can see a construction project taking place here at East River Park, where this is one of the sustainability, probably sustainability, this is one of the resiliency projects that are underway to protect the neighborhood from floods in the future. This has been somewhat controversial. East River Park was built by Robert Moses. He was the master builder in the mid 20th century. I will return to Moses later. And so the park was built in the 1930s during the de Blasio administration. Mayor Bill de Blasio was the former mayor of New York City. They worked out an agreement about how to create a more resilient East River Park. Initially, the idea was along the shoreline, they would have an area that could be flooded. It would act like a sponge and absorb the water from the high tides, the storm surges, inland closer to the buildings, these mounds of dirt would be built, and it's called a berm, and that would provide protection from the inland areas. But they scratched that plan after a lot of community input because Con Edison had high-speed transmission lines below the park that might have ended up getting flooded. So in the end, they just tore down the southern end of the park. They're going to raise it about eight feet or so, and the park will act as a barrier for the water. On our right-hand side is the redevelopment of the Domino Sugar site. And the Domino was, of course, a very important brand in the sugar refinery that used to dominate much of this Williamsburg waterfront. The dark brown brick building, the outer shell with the single smokestack was the refinery building, is being that external, that facade is, has been refurbished Inside of it, they're building out a steel frame glass clad office building that has that barrel vaulted arch rooftop. And then to the right, that donut shaped building with the dark brown base and the zinc silvery cladding on top it was the first of the new residential offerings here by shop architects. I'll probably mention the local New York City architectural firm shop architects a handful of times. And then to the left, that all white, much taller, mixed use building as in residential and office is 1 South 1st Street by Cook Fox. In the foreground, you'll notice that lightish green blue elevated walkway. It's called the Artifact Walk, somewhat in the spirit of the High Line. As you walk across that elevated platform, you can look down at preserved industrial relics from the Domino plant, as well as those two prominent cranes. On our left, we have a chain of public housing 
starting from the Williamsburg Great that just passed under up to the huge Fort Street and Howell Street, three separate public housing developments here to Ruth, William Wall and Jacob Reese to our north. The public housing in New York City has often been built in the lowest line land, most susceptible to flooding. So when Superstorm Sandy struck, public housing took a huge hit. And many of these neighborhoods, including here, these lower east sides were flooded, considerable building damage. Public housing in New York City has to make about 45 billion to the B dollars of improvement over the years. The good news is they have made a number of improvements in some housing development. If you look at the rooftop of some of these buildings, we're now talking Lillian Wald houses. You can see those great colored construction trailers on the rooftop. That is where they house backup generators. And so they've moved, as I've wow. mentioned a couple of times, the building system above ground level and the generators all the way on the rooftop. They've rebuilt the rooftop and the mechanical electrical and plumbing systems are also have to be built and protected. So that's at least good progress on the resiliency front here and a number and a number of public housing developments throughout the city. We're going to have more weight components from the port side of the uh Oh, <laughs> here are the waves coming. It's about to get very bumpy. Oh. <laughs> All right, everyone, hold on. The waves are increasing. Hey, Laura says, I am definitely going on this trip. Susie says, I'm happy uh, they don't avoid the discussion of public housing. Yes. Specifically about sustainable architecture. Patrick, hello, Han. Hello, Justin. Actually, we have a spectacular view of the Empire State Building just ahead of us. That tall, soaring, famous Indiana limestone clad tower with a couple setbacks and that silvery cylindrical tube with Art Deco pins that projects out towards us. That is the famous Empire State Building at 34th Street and 5th Avenue. Had the title of the tallest tower in the world for 40 years until the completion of the Twin Towers in 1973. Beautiful Empire State Building, more than 1,400 feet high. That cylindrical section up top is going to be a mooring mass for dirigible, dirigible for those long balloon like structures that were flying structures that were going to dock there at that high elevation that the wind was way too ferocious. They gave up that effort and they converted the lower and upper levels to the observation deck that we have today. And we're starting to see now the skyline of Midtown Manhattan. Meg is dropping important information about classic harbor lines. So be sure to read the comments. Susie says, I hope, I'm happy they don't avoid the discussion of public housing. It's very important in New York City, especially when it, it's part of a big chunk of this area of the waterfront. Hello, Patrick. Patrick says, I'm here. Hey, Patrick, nice to see you You'll here. My Christmas in New York, that's awesome. Thank you so much for tuning in. On the right, the large pyramid shape, the New York life okay. insurance Let's building. Zoom in. If you look to the left, there's a small the cupola crown of Splendid Tower, the Metropolitan Life Insurance Building from 1909, a design and 
inspired by St. Mark Campanile in Venice, Italy. And that light that developed those round brick buildings on the shoreline, Peter Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village, probably the most famous middle class housing development from the mid 20th century. These are classic examples of slum clearance or urban renewal programs. Met Life used the state tower of eminent domain to tear down the old Jack House district, displace thousands, and construct these towers in the park on a huge superblock. Superblock is when they remove the street and avenues. And these middle class subsidized housing offerings were primarily intended for World War II veterans and their families as long as they were white. There was great discrimination here until about the early 1960s when that light was forced to immigrate. Wow. These views always will be magical. We, earlier, Doug mentioned shop architects that designed one of the buildings in Dumbo. This is another shop architects building right here, the right copper building. Body of water. It is Newtown Creek. It separates Brooklyn, Greenpoint, yeah. Brooklyn, from Long Island City, Queens, which we're now across from Queens. You notice that new green grass sloping park along the shoreline. That is Hunter's Point South Park. Really beautiful. I like visiting it. On the other side of the loose stone, right along the edge of the water, is a portion of the park that actually gets flooded during high tide. So it's a tidal wetland and partially built. Though actually, the park was built to mitigate, they hope, the impact of storm surges in the future because they have not built back a long out of city in terms of construction of building tall residential towers along the shoreline after Superstorm Sandy struck. Uh, what tide are we at right now? I will guess it's ebb tide. Are we at ebb tide, Captain? Yes, I can feel it. Ebb, the tide is going out right now. Otherwise, we would be going faster up the East River. And it is getting chilly. So Newtown Creek sends so all the way into Bush low tide to give you a clearer answer. And here we're seeing Long Island City, not to be confused with Long Island. Yes, there are this a is in Queens, of one of the five boroughs of New York. Of Long Island City on our right. The question is, weren't they concerned about the flood warning? These buildings are built along the along the shoreline. Actually, the new buildings have very sturdy foundations that are watertight as well, and sometimes those foundations go up about 10 feet or more, up to what's called the design flood elevation, so they're protected. It's older buildings that are actually going to suffer more damage. On our left-hand side, you can see an H-shaped residential complex with dark brown cladding on the sides, and the silhouette looks a bit like a couple doing a partnership dance, such as a foxtrot or waltz, I imagine. So these are known informally as the dancing towers by shop architects, even though formally they're known as the American Copper Building. And that sky bridge of three heights joins the towers together, and the lowest floor of the sky bridge actually has a full-length black pool. So you can swim from one side to the other, suspended in the air. If you look inland on the Manhattan side and up, and up you can see one of the most beloved of the Art Deco towers, the Chrysler Building. Toward the top you'll notice a series of arches, each embedded with a sunburst motif. Those arches taper in size until you reach the stainless steel spire. If you look at the lowest arch, go down seven floors, you can see those silvery eagle-shaped gargoyles projecting outwards. Those are actually designed after hood ornaments from Chrysler automobiles. The Chrysler building was a private real estate development by Walter P. Chrysler, founder of the Chrysler Automobile Company. So he had 
his architect, William Van Allen, incorporate design elements from his cars. Much closer to us, that green tinted glass clad office building is the secretary building office tower at the United Nations. The Rockefeller family donated the land in this east portion of Midtown to the United Nations so the UN would be here in New York City. And this is a good example of the international style. While the Art Deco style is known for its rich, rich embellishment, the international style was completely opposite. It made no reference to earlier styles of architecture. It was a celebration of the then modern building materials and building techniques, having a steel frame reinforced concrete. And since the facade played no role in the support of the weight of the tower, you could have large plate glass windows offering spectacular, spectacular views outward. I'm going to stop saying how beautiful the day is, but it really is great. And we have wonderful illumination of the skyline of Midtown Manhattan right now. If you look up at that tall, slender white tower, that is 432 Park Avenue, one of the billionaire row or super tall towers we'll talk about more when we're on the Hudson River to the left. That white aluminum clad icon of the Midtown skyline with the sloping rooftop. It's a city port building from the mid 1970s. Closer to us is Roosevelt Island. We, we're just coming to the end of this off-white granite Four Freedoms Park with the rows of little leaf linden trees that honors Franklin Delano Roosevelt. To the right of that, the ivy-covered hospital is the old smallpox hospital, the remnants of that hospital from Black back when this was Blackwell's Island in the 19th century, which used to be a dumping ground for New York City's unwanted. All right, let's check out the bar, shall we? Let's see if I can order a cocktail. And feel free to ask me or Doug any questions. Hey, what cocktails do you guys have? Cocktail? Yeah. So we got Bloody Mary, we got Manhattan, yeah. Cosmopolitan. Is it possible to do a Negroni? Negroni? Yeah. Sounds great. I want I'll Negroni. Bring it to your table. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. All right, so we're going to have Negroni. On our immediate left is the new academic campus for Cornell NYC Tech that opened about three years ago. This is an example of a net zero energy campus. It means it reduces to renewable energy sources such as arrays of photovoltaic panels and what's called geothermal energy about all of the energy that they consume here. We're going under the Queensboro Bridge, and if you look toward the Manhattan side, on the other side of the channel of Roosevelt Island, you can see the cables running along the top of the Queensboro Bridge that carry the red and white cars for the aerial tram. You can see one of those oh, aerial wow. trams right. that is coming towards us. It's a fun way to visit so cool. Roosevelt Island. I've taken it many times and it's definitely worthwhile to come here, especially go south and explore the Cornell NYC Tech Campus and the Four Freedoms Park.
on our right side back of Long Island City, Queens, if you look at the base of these trees and in the background, past, past the orange shirted soccer players, you can just make out the brown brick bases of the Queens Bridge houses, one of the largest public housing developments in, in New York City and the United States. I mention that because not only are public housing developments usually on low lying lands that can be easily flooded, they also tend to be near the large power plants and manufacturing centers. And we are arriving at the largest power plant in New York City. This is the Ravenswood plant, also known informally as Big Alice, the name of one of the generators from the 1960s. In New York City right now, almost 90% of our electricity comes from fossil fuels. We have ambitious plans, as I alluded to before, to transition primarily to renewable energy sources, but we have a long way to go. And just a year ago, we completed the close down of the Indian Point Nuclear Facility. The Indian Point Nuclear Facility is on the Hudson River, about 40 miles north of New York City. And they closed it down because a lot of activists were critical of nuclear power. There are good reasons to criticize nuclear power. You can have an accident, deal with the long term nuclear waste. The other way to look at it is. Maybe we should have waited a few years to close down the nuclear plant because it does not emit greenhouse gases that warm the planet until we were producing a larger amount of renewable energy for our electricity. But I could easily defend either side of that argument. So in New York City, we have what are called baseload plants and peaker plants. Baseload plants are the plants that are always operating generating a base amount of electricity. The peaker plants tend to be much more controversial. The peaker plants are always on standby, but they are actually not used until we're going to have huge demand on our electrical grid, which usually strikes on super hot days. So if we have a 90 degree plus day, that is when everyone cranks up their air conditioners, especially late afternoon, early evening, and the demand is quite high on our electrical grid, and that's when the peaker plants are activated. What, is hope, what we hope happens in New York State is that we generate a lot more electricity, as I mentioned, from solar panels and wind, and also pull more energy from hydroelectric dams, and then some of these plants will actually be converted into battery storage facilities that will store the electricity generated from renewable energy sources. The reason why you need the battery storage is because both wind and solar power are intermittent source of electricity. You only sometimes have wind power, you only sometimes have clear skies so the sun can illuminate the photovoltaic panels. So you generate the electricity when you can, you then transmit it to large arrays of batteries that store the electricity, and the electricity is pulled by customers when they want to consume it. So there's a slight mis mix. I'll try again on this Saturday afternoon. There's a mix match. Does that even work? Between that doesn't even work either. Okay, there's an imbalance between when electricity is generated and when electricity is consumed. You can't use that clip. <laughs> <laughs> Edit. Okay, everyone, omit that. <laughs> uh, Doug, we have a question. Why is there, um, why are the electrical plants mostly on the waterfront and not deeper in land? The reason why the water, excuse me, the reason why the power plants are along the waterways is because they were initially powered by coal that was brought here on barges, and now they almost all have natural gas hookups, so it technically doesn't matter where they're located, but of course they're not gonna move them right. anytime soon. Exactly. Thank you so much. You'll notice on our left-hand side, there's an American flag that is definitely not billowing in the wind on top of a rooftop structure. Negroni. 
gray slate rooftop and that curves downward. That's technically a mansard roof, a two-level roof. Has those dormer windows projecting outwards. Today, this wonderful structure is the entranceway to a two-wing residential complex. But it was initially built in the 1830s as what they called the New York City Lunatic Asylum, not a term we would use today, a psychiatric center. Fifty years after it opened, Nellie Bly, some of you may know the name, Nellie Bly was a famous muckraking journalist. She feigned psychological problems to get herself committed there. After she extracted herself, she wrote a very famous book called Ten Days in the Madhouse that exposed how horrendous the conditions there were, and that slowly led to improvements at the hospitals, psychiatric centers, and prisons that dotted this island. Is that former Gunpig Asylum is on Randall's Island. So that would be across from maybe in the equal to the East 80s across the river. So Greek, uh, Cindy it says, I love the Mansour roof. With yeah. The luxury rental building with the two wings. It is very beautiful. Uh, one of the older buildings, now it's a condominium. Here we're seeing the tip of Roosevelt Island. We're seeing the old lighthouse. A question about this new sculptural installation on our left with the metallic silvery spheres and the bronze masks. This is by Amanda Randalls. It's very recent and in part those masks honor Nellie Bly. I don't know the specific name, but if you look up Amanda Randall's governor's uh, Randall's uh, nope Roosevelt Island. He will find on our left hand side, back in Manhattan, where you see the tree covering. That is Carl Schurz Park. You'll notice a right flat here. pole on the right side of the park. Immediately on the other side of the park. You can peer through those trees and pass the flagpole and see a yellow clapboard home with green window shutters. That is Gracie Mansion, where our mayor lives. What's the name of our mayor? Eric Adams, that was too easy for you guys. <laughs> that Eric Adams has been living there since about January of this year when he became mayor. Many mayors have lived there since Fiorell LaGuardia. And during those years, only one mayor has not lived there. Anybody know the name of that mayor? Bloomberg. Mayor Michael Bloomberg was the only mayor not to live there. He continued to live in his townhome mansion just a few blocks to the south, but he invested his own money in the historic restoration of that home that dates back to the just after the American Revolutionary War when Archibald Gracie built his estate here, far removed from the center of the population, much further to the south. On our right, if we were going to continue under on the river, we would go under those two bridges. So we are going to head north and transition to the Harlem River. The bridge in the background, that red colored six steel arch bridge, was built by Pennsylvania Railroad. It only carries railroad traffic, and it's the Hellgate Bridge from 1917. In the foreground, that lightweight oh, fence is part right here. of the Triborough Complex. That link three boroughs, thus the Tri Borough Bridge, even though it's officially the Robert F. Kennedy Bridge, nobody calls it by that name today. And that bridge, which opened in 1936, was built by Robert Moses, the master builder of the mid 20th century, somewhat controversial today. In the early 1970s, the author Robert Carroll wrote the 
master, nope, he wrote The Power Broker, about a 1,200 page book that won a Pulitzer Prize about the life and time and many infrastructure projects and more of Robert Moses. Robert Moses was a brilliant administrator. He was able to get projects done ranging from bridges, tunnels, parkways, highways, affordable housing developments like here in East Harlem, playgrounds, parks, and beaches like Jones Beach out in Long Island. He could get these projects done that had been on the books for eons and nobody else could complete. It also helped that during the Great Depression, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president, native son of New York State, former governor, and a lot of the New Deal funding came right here to Robert Moses' project. It was also ruthless. If he, say, was building a parkway out in Long Island, he would just displace the entire neighborhood and complete his project. He was not an, he was not an elected politician. He was an urban planner, but he amassed so much power for himself that nobody really could support his project, and he just went ahead. projects were for the benefit of automobiles and not for public transportation. And we lament, looking back, that it would have been much more effective if he had continued to build out public transportation in New York City so that we hopefully could wean more people off automobiles today. But the truth is, on a couple counts, any urban planner in the mid-20th century would have been celebrating automobiles. It wasn't until the 1950s when President Eisenhower oversaw the build-out of our interstate highway, and if it wasn't Moses, there would have been another urban planner who would have been optimizing the shoreline for automobiles, as we see on our left-hand side, many, much of the shoreline throughout the city, as, as we've seen on this trip today, has been for highways, even though we've tried to build in the parks and the spaces that were available. I don't mean to let Moses off the hook, but he just represents an overall approach, which would have been followed by almost any urban planner. It's just that he was much more effective in implementing these projects and getting things done. On the west side, they, he did build the West Side Highway, which was dismantled in the 1980s. So that shoreline definitely was optimized for automobiles as well. It's just that it, this may be, yes, the elevated old West Side Highway is built by Moses, and the Hudson River Parkway, which we call the West Side Highway as well, further north, was built by Moses as well. It's just fortunate that on the west side of Manhattan, unlike much of the east side, there simply was more room to build down parts, even though those highways were there. All right, now we're going further uptown in Manhattan over here. We're starting to see uh, neighborhoods like East Harlem, El Barrio where it was predominantly a Puerto Rican neighborhood uh, for nearly half a century. Yeah. And high-speed FDNY, fire department boat right there. Uh, Meg, thank you so much for letting us know. Meg said that there's some delicious fall themed cocktails on the menu as well. Yeah, the I mean, Negroni I'm drinking is very good as well. And Susie says, I wanted to see the play in the shed about Robert Moses, but couldn't get tickets. Yeah, Robert Moses is recently becoming back in the spotlight, the master urban planner of New York for many decades, because there is now a play about him at the shed until December, which is, the shed is located in We have yards. huge challenges in New York City, especially on the housing front. We don't have enough affordable housing, public housing, and the number of homeless has gone up as well. Plus, the governor of Texas is more migrants from the border, many from Venezuela, here to New York City in buses that are constantly arriving. So New York City, as you can see on our media right, has been building tents, such as these white tents that house 500 men who are seeking asylum here. Initially, they were they built the tents in Orchard Beach in the Bronx, in the Bronx, which is further east, but it flooded 
and so they moved the tents here. And it's not clear what New York City is going to do. We offer asylum to anybody who seeks it, and we simply don't have enough housing shelter for those people arriving. Right now, we're st still seeing the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Drive that goes north-south on the island of Manhattan. Susie says the available tickets for Robert Moses' play was way too expensive. Yes, indeed they are. Uh, Patrick asks, are the drinks including the price of the round trip? If we can have Meg let us know the details about drinks and food, those do let us know. They have cocktails, beer, they have fall bean cocktails. They have uh, wine as well, and there's like a shrimp cocktail, and a hummus plate, and a fruit plate too. Nickens, nice to see you here. Hello, KDomCom, welcome. Mandy says, this is the first time you have done the tour. I did the tour for the first time two days ago on Classic Harbor Line. I've been on many other uh, Circle Line tours. We are Virginia. under another span for the Tribro Bridge. This span connects to Harlem at 125th Street on our left. This is an example of a vertical lift bridge, meaning that central span will be hoisted upwards for taller boat steps. This is a vertical lift bridge. I'll actually delve more into vertical lift bridges just a little further north on the Harlem Bridge to point out how they operate. So Meg is letting us know that the first drink beer or soda coffee is included uh, with each ticket and then buy, uh, people are welcome to buy additional drinks. So much Meg. Meg works for Classic Harbor Line. The tour of Classic Harbor Line. You know, I went for the first time two days ago. I've been meaning to go for quite a while, just on my own. And I'm really impressed. I'm not just saying that because Classic Harbor Line sponsored this takeover. But beyond that, as just a New Yorker, uh, I, I really like that I'm able to see the entire waterfront in style. It's truly beautiful. I really recommend it, actually. If you have the budget for it, tickets are between $86 and $100. I would recommend that they have a, the, another I'm variety of... Borough of New York City. This is the Bronx. And Manhattan continues on our left. In the Bronx, on our right, we have the neighborhood of Bot Haven. Surprisingly, this used to have the largest concentration of piano manufacturing plants anywhere else in the United States. And some of those piano plants still stand, but they're residential buildings and warehouses today. What is very surprising is the huge number of new residential buildings under construction here in Mott Haven. 5,000 new residential units are coming online, a mix of market and subsidized housing. As all levels of government pass climate change legislation, meaning on the federal, state, and city level, one of the key components of many of the pieces of legislation that have passed so far deal with the question of equity and wow. environmental justice. That if you take a neighborhood like Mod Haven here, it has many challenges, especially compared to other neighborhoods in New York City. Some of the neighborhoods face the, all the same challenges. 
in a city you have what is called the urban heat island effect, meaning it will always be hotter in cities compared to surrounding suburbs and countries. We simply absorb huge amounts of heat. Uh, you could have dark tar rooftops, dark asphalt streets, and we're absorb absorbing a lot of heat. But there are disparities even within New York City from one neighborhood to the next. Mont Haven, for example, has about 16% of the neighborhood covered in parks and tree covering. If you compare that to a neighborhood in Riverdale, for example, Riverdale is also in the Bronx. It's like a suburban neighborhood. has about 66% tree covering. That tree covering, that green space, is really critical. You have shade and leaves offer uh, moisture that help pull down uh, neighborhoods and you simply have more park space as well. There could be a differential of 10 degrees from one of these neighborhoods to the next. And as the predictions go, we're going to have many more super hot days above 9 degrees. And when that happens, that 10 degree differential could be painful and could be very dangerous and lead people end up in the hospital as well. So in order to, to deal with the disparities, the legislation that have recently been passed, including here in New York State and the city, are addressing some of these disparities, making sure there's enough cooling center, making sure there's programs to get people air conditioners, and lowering some neighborhoods where there tend to be a larger percentage of people of color who live in these neighborhoods. And that's really just the beginning. We've seen some great parks. Look at our immediate right. We have a railroad trestle, the Oak Point Link Railroad Trestle, making it difficult to build out parks here right along the waterways. We have many highways just inland, currently out of view. The Major Deegan Highway. On the other side, you have the Bruckner Highway. And of course, many cars, trucks, burning diesel, gasoline, pumping pollution, and greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and simply more power plants and manufacturing centers. I'll leave it there, but there are a huge number of elements where there are disparities that have to be addressed as we move forward trying to address the challenges of climate change. So Meg in the comments is saying that uh, Classic Harbor Lines operates year-round and they have a variety of different cruises throughout the year, including fall foliage cruises. Um, Patrick asks, what's the temperature right now? Right now it's about 61 degrees Fahrenheit. It is feeling a little bit chillier because there is a breeze and of course we're on a moving boat. Uh, so yes, do bring a sweater if you're coming this time of year. Bring a layer, it's important. But as Meg mentioned earlier from Classic Harbor Line, uh, there is heat inside. Susie says, nice shot. I am just stunned by the development of Mott Haven in the Bronx. This grew basically out of nowhere 10 years ago, a little bit, a little bit less than 10 years. Very, very new recent development. That train that we saw passing through is the Metro on North on train right from Grand Central Terminal. We landed up at the tallest building. We can see the upper floors of 425 Grand Concourse. Grand Concourse is that beautiful wide boulevard in the Bronx that has many recently refurbished Art Deco buildings and many other styles represented. This new building has large numbers of units for lower income families and it's an example of a passive house building. Passive house is a type of green building. They, in order to get that certification, you have to significantly reduce your use of fossil fuels and use passive systems made in passive house in order to warm or cool residential offerings. That's a very brief overview, but if afterwards you want a more in-depth view or understanding of passive houses, I'm happy to do that. This building on our media right is called the largely subsidized housing as well. 
NFL have a, they already have a new, what they call a universal hip-hop museum. There's hip-hop that started in the Bronx in the early 1970s. If you want to know the story about Wind Manuel Miranda and Hamilton and hip hop, oh, wow. let me know. If that not, I'll stick to architecture and climate change. All right, so if you want to learn about hip hop, about Limino Miranda, ask now. I'll ask uh, Doug to talk more about it. Should I ignore the Yankees today <laughs> after their horrendous and Stay tuned, we're about to see. Astros, we're about to see fall foliage right now, so stay tuned because we're about to oh, see the beautiful yeah, cliff sides of New Jersey in Wind Manhattan. It's going to be breathtaking. Uh, and then let me know if you have any questions. And let me know where you're watching from. Hello, Hooked on Steph. Hello, Brittany Johnson, Jocelyn. This is here, Oscar. And Naviana, thank you. Welcome. The last stop on the number three subway, and that subway terminal was flooded as a result of the storm surges. So the MTA, the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, that operates the subway, built the flood wall. So the next time we're struck by a hurricane, hopefully it will not be inundated that terminal. On the right, we can see. The Yankee Stadium, where they're not playing in the World Series this year. This is the relatively new Yankee Stadium from 2009. The earlier stadium was just to the right. That earlier stadium was the house that Ruth built in honor of Babe Ruth's home run king. And we are approaching one of my favorite swing bridges. This is the Camp Swing Bridge with its decorative features, including the finials on top and those red tiled shelter houses on the corner. As we go under this swing bridge, you can look immediately to the left. You'll see that steel circular girder that rests on those orange colored oh, wow. rollers. That is the turn mechanism that rotates 90 degrees, bringing the swing stand section above with it, creating a channel for larger posts to be able to pass through. Patrick from South Central Worcester, Worcester County, Massachusetts. Nice to see you here, Patrick. Hello, Dube. Hello, Aliyah. Steph, welcome to the live video. Right now, we're live streaming on this beautiful day of October 29th, 2022. People are inside enjoying their food, their drinks at the classic Harbor Line. Susie says, girl, why the Yankees? <laughs> I'm not, I don't know too much about baseball, but apparently they're not in the World Series. But they won a lot of World Series, lo and behold. And you can see how large Manhattan is. It just keeps on going and going and going. And going and going. And now we're approaching Washington Heights, which Doug mentioned earlier, Lin-Manuel Miranda. Before there was a Hamilton, there was an amazing Broadway musical in the Heights takes place in this neighborhood over here behind those trees one of the higher points of Manhattan we see high bridge tower right down there this provided all the water supply well the bridge right next to it provided all the water supply for New York City for a very very long time it was because of that bridge one of the old the oldest bridge in New York City that New York City grew prevents a lot of diseases let's uh, hop into the other side and see it Right here, we're seeing it from a distance. High bridge. Surprisingly, not that many tourists go to it. I mean, it's just a bridge. But it is cool to know when you're standing on it. Half of it, as you can see, is new, but the other half is indeed the original version from more than 120 something years, even more than that ago. beautiful day we're starting to see the full foliage all the trees look at this all the gorgeous trees oh my god I am in love hello Kelly welcome hello Annette nice to see you here Wow all right it's getting chilly let's go back inside Second loser 
At the top of the hill on the Manhattan side is a slender stone water tower that I'll return to in a moment. If you look to the right side of the bridge we're coming up to, you'll notice those masonry, mostly slender arches. They may remind you of an ancient Roman aqueduct bridge, which would be appropriate because this high bridge from the 1840s was part of an aqueduct system that brought the first external fresh water source from the Croton Reservoir in Westchester. The Crump Reservoir is 40 miles north of 42nd Street. The aqueduct carried the water south in Westchester, south of the Bronx, and at this point on the Bronx side, the high bridge carried that Crump water to Manhattan. The water initially went straight south to the center of the population. 20 years later, they constructed that water tower on the top of the hill on the Manhattan side to pump that croak water to a higher elevation, stored it in the adjoining reservoir, so people in Washington Heights here and Inwood at the northern tip of the island would have the same access to that water. In the 1930s, Robert Moses converted that reservoir by the side of the water tower into a public pool. It's a very large public pool. Has anybody seen the movie In the Heights? by Lin-Manuel Miranda. Lin-Manuel Miranda wrote and starred in Hamilton before Hamilton's Broadway debut was in the Heights. He grew up in Washington Heights here and in Inwood, so partly based on his life growing up. And they made the movie in the Heights just a couple years ago. There's a wonderful dance scene that is filmed in that pool right by the High Bridge Water Tower. Welcome Jane, welcome Adriana, Tink, nice to see you here, Annette, welcome everyone. Right now we're seeing a whole pile of schists all around us, oh, we're in the splash zone too, but right here we're seeing the exposed Manhattan schist, this is the bedrock of New York City, one of the reasons that allows such massive skyscrapers to be built. Over here we see exposed, but for downtown you go, it's deep underground. So these views are just stunning. If you're definitely coming in your city during the autumn, uh, you'll be blown away with all the leaves changing. You can follow that forecast online as well. But Classic Harbor Lines offers a fall foliage cruise too, so you can see even more of the beautiful leaves and the treescapes here in northern New York City. I am blown away. Let me know if you have any questions.
on our left hand side is a wonderful Victorian inspired boathouse, green and yellow, inspired by the old wooden boathouses that used to dot this shoreline, yes, on our immediate left. And this boathouse is primarily used by community crew teams to store their racing shells here. And they practice right here on the Harlem River. Just behind, the boathouse was made possible by Bette Midler, the famous singer, performer, actor, movie star, theater star, and many other things. And she's also responsible for Swindler's Cove Park, the park in the background. It's a wonderful five-acre wooded park with its own tidal wetlands. Hey, Lorene, nice to see you here. Lorene tuning in from Hawaii. Uh, her Lorene says, Hi, Lorene. Lorene says, I would not be able to watch this due to motion sickness. Uh, Lorene, oh yeah, I feel you. Um, it is possible. It's still a very steady boat that I would recommend uh, coming in on. Even if you have a little bit of motion sickness, I think it is still doable. Because, especially on the left, time of year, it's pretty relaxed. building with the sailboat theme is simply Second a con Edison or consolidated <laughs> Edison substation. They covered up some of their transmission equipment. And here's my dad too. We were supposed to have a new Esplanade wrapping around this Sherman Creek neighborhood, but no money was ever allocated for that. Susie says this is the best time of year. Indeed, it is. Hi, Susie. Second <laughs> producer said, "Hi, Susie." So I indeed uh, brought my dad over here today. My parents, they'd never been on a Circle Line cruise before, all around the entire, circling all around the entire island of Manhattan. <laughs> um, and it's a pleasure to bring them all along here on this journey. Says, thank you, I will consider it. Pro tip, you can always take Drumamine. Just don't drink alcohol while doing it. Um, that's a pro tip I will offer. Mika says, please say hello to your parents. Yes, will do. And uh, Lorraine says, please say aloha. Yes, will do. On our left-hand side, we can get a brief peek into an overhaul and repair shop for New York City subways. This is the 207th Street yard. And just like we saw before, we saw that gray flood wall. We have another flood wall here that was just completed last year. So that the next time we're hit by a superstorm, there will not be flooding here. This one looks like a collection of interconnected mini silo shapes. Essentially, it's these steel cylindrical hollow tubes that are joined together. So right now we are passing through the north right over here about to turn around the island of Manhattan. Have you ever realized that Manhattan is this long? Never. Never, yeah, so, yeah. Such long, yeah. There are at least 10 feet. We have six of them, three meters, more than three meters, and a height. Their bases go much lower. That's pretty high for our, it's high tide right now. So this is the worst high that we see this year. And the storm surge would almost be uh, hey, let's try the shrimp uh, cocktail. Shrimp cocktail? Yeah, and then do you have the fall theme uh, cocktails? Or are they? Which <laughs> one? Um, I'm not sure. Which ones do you have? We have the special martini. Yes. We have the Jack Daniels. He said that? 
Ah, interesting. Okay, okay the Jack Daniels one. I'll try. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna try uh, one of the fall themed cocktails. See how it is, and also a shrimp cocktail, which is not a drink. <laughs> it's actual shrimp. So let's try it out. And Susie says, serious uh, camera lens my dad has. Yes, indeed. He's a photographer for uh, many decades at this point. Indeed. A question about the East River, whether the East River is a river. We are not going to be on a single river today, despite that I've said we've been on the East River, the Harlem River, and the Hudson River. The East River and the Harlem River are not rivers. They don't have a source. They don't have a mouth at the end. They're tidal straits. They have two different bodies of water on either side. The Hudson River, where we are traveling, is a tidal estuary, a mix of salt water from the Atlantic and fresh water from the Hudson itself heading south. You'd have to go maybe 100 plus miles to be truly in a river on the Hudson River. The Hudson River's source is high up in the Adirondacks, all the way upstate New York, at Lake Tier of the Clouds. And even though I said we're not on a river, the mouth of the Hudson River at the end is the battery at the southern tip of Manhattan. So I've been fabricating stories the whole time since we haven't been on a single river. So we're going to try the Jack's Big Apple Fall Cocktail. Uh, this is one of their fall themed cocktails. It has Jack Daniels in it, hence the name Jack's Big Apple, and the, uh, apparently apple juice. So let's try it out. Oh wow, <laughs> it is punchy. You get a very strong kick of whiskey. Also I like that it's mixed with some apple juice. It is rather refreshing and strong at the same time. Mm. Oh that's so good. Stay thirsty my friends. All right, now I'm going to show you epic views of New York City. Thank you. So I tried the Jack's Big Apple, and then we're going to try a shrimp cocktail. Actually, I'll allow my dad to try, try it, try it, try it. Let us know how it is. <laughs> it's a shrimp cocktail. Good. <laughs> let me let me give it a try. So the cool thing is about these classic Harper line is that they have food on board, and I don't know. I feel like I'm in the Great Gatsby when I'm having one of these with a good cocktail. Oh, um, very juicy, juicy shrimp. You know, caught just overboard. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Probably further out, but. Very good shrimp, very juicy, very fresh. Love it. Thank you. 
the show. Close up. Petra says, how much are the drinks? $16 for the specialty uh, cocktails. And then uh, this shrimp cocktail place, $22 currently. As I mentioned, uh, you can pre-order the drinks. We are slowing the food. down because we are waiting for the Spike Dival Swing Bridge to open up. And there's an Amtrak train that is going to be crossing the Spite and Dival Swing Bridge. It's just ahead of us. It's a very low clearance swing bridge, so there's always a bridge operator there. The Amtrak trains have right of way, so once those trains pass, the swing bridge is open up for us. This is so cool. A spectacular view today. Behind the swing bridge, you'll see the leaves changing color along the New Jersey Palisades. So we don't see the swing bridge right now because we're waiting for it to turn. We'll see a little bit later. Uh, I guess uh, the captain receives a uh, signal ahead of time. Uh, Susie says, I'm, I'm hungry right now. How much for the shrimp cocktail? Yes, $22. Of course, prices are always subject to change. Right here we see another of the bridges. And here we see one of the Metro North stops. Right here. This one's amazing in order to see amazing architecture along uh, Bronx waterfront. Susie says, oh, a train is coming. Yes, indeed, it is. A train is coming along the Spiten Dival Swing Bridge, which is further up. But we're stopping here. And uh, actually, this train station should be the Spiten Dival stop. Spiten Dival means uh, spitting devil, something along the lines of that in Dutch. It was one of the original uh, Dutch names for one of the waterways here in New York City. We actually earlier passed by the Hell Gate which was one of the most dangerous waterways in all of New York, and that was a little bit earlier. So thank you so much, Meg. It says uh, drinks range between nine and eleven dollars for beer, and wine is sixteen uh, and for beer and wine, and sixteen dollars for specialty cocktails. And there is indeed table service, which is awesome. Very friendly service here see people already at the uh, outer deck enjoying some good views with some good cocktails and drinks one of the high rises here and it, if anyone could remind me the name of the beautiful houses that are just on the other side of this cliff uh, that I did a live video of about two years ago. Check it out, uh, Northern Bronx uh, live video. So search the Bronx Urbanist on YouTube and you'll see it. And it's gorgeous houses right on the cliff side and it feels like you're going to some old English cottage. Really mind blowing views. Right here in this area of Manhattan, I almost feel like I'm no longer in New York feels like I'm really transported to somewhere else far, far upstate or so. It goes to show how much waterfront there is of New York City to protect. Now he's getting the signal. Hello Mia, hello Daniel, hello SSG, hello Megan, welcome. Hello Catherine, everyone let me know where you're watching from. If you're just tuning in, share this video with uh, people who enjoy architecture, New York City, boat rides.
I just also love all the wooden furnishings here in this uh, 1920 style boat, the Manhattan One. There's also the Manhattan Two. There it is. Right there in the distance, the Spiton Dival Swing Bridge. Now it's opening again. A train just passed through it, which is amazing to think about if you're going on one of those uh, trains further up north in New York. Mika says, yes, the boat with all the wood is, is beautiful. Yes, indeed it is. Here we're starting to see more of the exposed schist all around New York City. Right behind there, we're starting to see the Palisades of New Jersey, the cliffsides of New Jersey. Gorgeous views of all the trees changing in color for this beautiful autumn. This area of New York is especially beautiful. And remember, we're still within the New York City metropolitan area. Here's another Metro North station. We are approaching the Spite and Dival Swing Bridge. I assume it's in its open position or opening up right now. <laughs> uh -oh. All right. So my mistake, the other train station had a different name. This is the Spites and Dival yeah, stop right here. The bridge we're going under now is the Henry Hudson Memorial Bridge. So if you've ever been on the west side highway, you go over this bridge, the upper level going to the Bronx and the lower level coming back from the Bronx. Here are the famous houses that are this along the cliffside. This was another Robert Moses bridge. The financiers thought he was not going to be successful because he was charging a toll of it was either five or ten cents initially when you go down the, to the Broadway Bridge and cross without paying anything. But it was such a convenience for drivers that they were willing. And initially it was the lower deck that opened. The bridge was so successful, they quickly, two years later, were able to complete the upper deck of this bridge. Wow, I love this area of the Bronx right over here. Oh, look at this. The only, the lowest line bridge in all of New York City. Right here, Spiked and Dival. Basically right at water level. And right there in the distance, we see the what used to be the Tappan Zee Bridge. Now it's the Mario Cuomo Bridge. That area is also Sleepy right. Hollow. We are looking north of the Hudson up. River. We can actually see... The White Captain Z Bridge, or now the Mario Cuomo Bridge, with the white diagonal emanating downward from each of the towers. Oh, and wow. off to our right is a spectacular view of the New Jersey Palisades with the leaves changing color to the orange and yellow and the brown. We are once again heading south on the Hudson River. As I just mentioned, wow. we have New Jersey Palisades on our right, and on our left, we have Manhattan. On the left side, we are looking at Inwood Hill Park at the northern tip of the island, the oldest growth forest on the island of Manhattan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a live time. stream. Yeah, it's on the whole oh, time. Yeah. That's interesting. So, 
Um, can you tell us a little bit about the cliffsides? Because here on the cliffside of the Bronx, there's beautiful housing. Do you know anything about that? I love yeah. the housing that is on the top of the hill in the Bronx and Riverdale. Right. It's got this wonderful quaint design. It has that sloping, multicolored roof tiles. And they actually have stone curving stairwells. All called do. the Charlotte Bronte houses. Co-ops, I believe, from the late 1920s. Picturesque views of the New Jersey Palisades on the other side. And do you know why there's not more development on the cliff sides? Oh, that there, there's limited, but it's actually set back your green open space. Okay. And then the residential buildings we do see are set back a bit. Mm. But you do have residential suburban like homes closer to the cliffs. We just don't oh. see them from this vantage point. And how about the on the New Jersey side? On the New Jersey side, much of this has been preserved. So you actually don't have many residential offerings looking right over toward the Hudson River, but you have this preserved landscape that they started protecting in the late 1800s. And it's a great treasure that here in New Jersey Palisades and the New York Palisades, a little to the north, that we have this wonderful vista. All right here, yeah. There. We have the Adirondack schooner uh, oh. sister ship on our left heading north. And you'll notice there's a valley on the Manhattan side. This is about 204th Street, Dykeman Street. And as you head up to the next hill, you'll notice a square shaped tower rising up with the Romanesque arch window openings and the red tile rooftop. This complex is the Cloisters, part of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is where they house their medieval art and architecture collection, another project made possible by the Rockefeller family. I never know how to talk about the Rockefellers on a tour that is about climate change. <laughs> the Rockefellers, of course, made their fortune from oil and refinery. It was John Rockefeller who found it. Company at the end of the 1800s and following Rockefeller generations continue to benefit from oil sales as well. But the truth is, later generations of Rockefellers have made a huge impact on the climate change front, protecting the environment and natural resources. And so they, they've even divested from fossil fuels in terms of their Rockefeller Brothers investment vehicle. Returning to the Cloisters here, this was an initiative of John G, excuse me, this was an initiative of John D. Rockefeller Jr. He purchased a collection of artifacts from monastic sites, both from France and Spain, donated them to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The architect Charles Collins was commissioned and he assembled those Romanesque and Gothic elements into the cloisters that we have today. I pointed out the Romanesque towers, but if you look at the base, the more horizontal base, you'll notice those lightly colored painted style windows with the pointed arch shapes and the tracery core elements of the Gothic style. So you see the fusion of those two styles the Rockefellers also donated their unicorn tapestries, which are always on view. They gave the land on top of this hill to New York City, so it became Fort Tryon, a New York City park. And Junior purchased 700 acres of land on the New Jersey side as part of an ongoing effort to preserve this landscape from commercial development. Some people mentioned about Palisades Park. Uh, do you remember anything about it? Question or the park? Yeah, about yeah. the park that used to be here. That, no, the amusement park that people oh, are asking. About. Yes, there used to be an amusement park. When I was a kid, yeah. I actually went there. When we travel on the Upper West Side in the late '60s, I remember this that we saw the huge Ferris wheel in Palisades Amusement Park. I believe it was torn down 
in the early 1970s. Oh. And I only went there once. We went on the Ferris wheel, we went on the roller coaster, and it was this really rickety wooden structure that shook like crazy. It was a bit of a nerve-wracking experience. Oh, I can yeah. imagine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. So everyone, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Feel free to ask us any questions or Doug any questions. Of course, Doug is doing this all off the top of we his head. Uh, no script, the just going off and telling of off all the cool facts all around the city. Washington so that's amazing. Bridge, so round of hearts for Doug right now, who's giving us an amazing tour all to around New York City. And Meg just said that that was a sister Lee, show. New Jersey. Initially, the suspension bridge only featured the upper deck but these X-brace towers were designed so a lower deck could be incorporated into the bridge's structure. That lower deck was added in the early 1960s. As with other suspension bridges, you have that bar, long inverted arch, and once the lower deck was added, they added that stiffening truss where you see those diagonal elements that play a role in allowing the bridge to carry larger and heavier live load of the buses and the trucks and cars that cross over. On our immediate left-hand side, that red lighthouse was recently repainted as in about two weeks ago or so. This is Jeffrey's Hook Lighthouse, made famous by a children's book, The Little Red Lighthouse and the Great Great Bridge that tells the sad saga of how this lighthouse was going to be dismantled because the illumination from above was more than sufficient to help captains navigate at night. But there were so many fans of this lighthouse, both adults and children, they participated in a, light, in a letter writing campaign and they obviously saved the day. The lighthouse was never torn down. You'll notice there are three identical residential buildings on the Manhattan side. If you look behind the two leftmost ones, you can see the new high-tech medical center for Columbia University. It features those light concrete bands wrapping around the glazing, the large windows in an irregular manner on its right side. This is a design by Diller, Scofidio, and Renfro. The architectural firm founded by Elizabeth Diller and Ricardo Scofidio, the architects of the High Line and the latest redesign and expansion of MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art. That is amazing. We're starting to see Columbia University. That's the wonderful the medical school. Dillo, Scofidio, and Renfo, as Doug just mentioned, famous for building uh, the High Line, designing it. Uh, Susie says, I remember the Palisades Park, also the TV commercials. Uh, yes, I was born in Queens in 59, says Cindy. I have faint memory of the park also. Uh, Daniel says, this is absolutely amazing. Please consider doing this more often. Uh, so us from Norway can watch this regularly. Yeah, you can check out my own live streams, Urbanist Exploring Cities, uh, which is on YouTube. But also, this will be on the Classic Harbor Line Instagram and YouTube. Classic Harbor Line on YouTube. You can follow this replay, well, and they also probably will Washington continue live streaming other uh, the tours that they do as well, and also showing you amazing videos. 100 large-scale murals painted on the sides of many buildings that depict about 136 bird species that are under threat from climate change. It's a project of the Audubon Society, named after John James Audubon, the famous ornithologist who painted those life-sized birds of North America. And those murals are painted by a variety of street artists. And New York City recently passed legislation in order to stop the killing of many millions of birds that hit these glass-clad office and residential buildings and buildings that are new buildings and buildings undergoing significant transformations will have to add new glass cladding that features geometric shapes 
that will be seen by birds or more likely to be seen by birds and they will not go flying into these residential towers. Usually the most danger is at the lowest floors clad with glass that are reflecting the greenery, the trees, the flowers, and birds think they're actually trees. On our immediate left is Trinity Cemetery and Mausoleum. Immediately to the left of the cemetery, there's a wide cross street. That is West 155th Street. And in 1811, New York City built out its street grid, its rectilinear street grid that features the north-south avenues and the east-west cross streets. Does anybody know Street Zero? What is the name of Street Zero of this street grid? It is actually Houston Street, just south of Greenwich Village. So that street grid came up here to 155th Street to the left of the cemetery, south of here, especially south of 96th Street, or more so south of 96th Street. Much of the island was leveled, the hills were torn down, and valleys filled in to have more or less of a smooth surface for building out that road. You may have noticed those many hills and valleys at the northern slender tip of the island. That is what the entire island used to look like. When the Lenny Lenape were here, the native peoples who lived here, in their Algonquin language, they called this Manahata Island of Many Hills. I mentioned earlier that the waterways are so much cleaner than they used to be. They used to be you had many factories in the Hudson River Valley north of New York City that dumped all kinds of pollution into the river that floated south. Plus, in New York City, we did not have sewage treatment plants like we have here on our left. This concrete structure with the cutout arch shapes that juts out towards us is the North River Sewage Treatment Plant, one of 14 of these plants in New York City that play the very vital role of cleaning the sewage before the much cleaner remnants, the effluent, is dumped into the waterways like the Hudson River. So the reason why when I was a kid in the 1960s and the 70s that I didn't have any connection with the waterways is because they were flat out filthy. You know, back then we wouldn't have had the New York City Triathlon with a swimming element in the Hudson River. That would have been absolutely preposterous and of course that does happen today. When they don't have the swimming component as part of the New York Triathlon today is when we have a huge rainstorm immediately before the triathlon because the bacteria levels go up way too high and it's dangerous to swim in those waters. So in New York City, I talked about resiliency in terms of dealing with flooding. I also talked about heat resiliency, the fact that we have increasingly hotter and hotter days in New York City and we will have to figure out how to contend with that heat. Another challenge are those clouds, some massive inundations when rain comes pouring into New York City. Just last year, at the beginning of September, we were struck by Hurricane Ida. In just one hour during that storm, we had three inches of rain in Central Park. We did not have the capacity to absorb so much water in a short period of time. Partly because wow. in New York City, it's not a material, and if you can absorb the, the water, then it will fall the and that rainwater actually goes towards our sewage system today, and usually as a result, the sewage So I'm going to interrupt Doug here slightly because this is one of the tallest churches in all of the United States of America, Riverside Church, also built by the Rockefeller family. And right next to it we have uh, Grant, General Grant's tomb, or President Grant's tomb, who was also the general during the Civil War. Structure more permeable surfaces, roadways, and parks, 
sidewalks that absorb the water? And how can we uh, construct more green rooftops that also have the ability to capture, absorb the water in some type of retention tank, and then filter the water and slow down how fast that water goes into our sewage treatment plants. And that whole component of what is called green infrastructure, we are in the process of building out. And it's a challenging process, expensive process, but overall it simply means how do we capture rainwater, slow it down, filter it, and keep it away from our sewage treatment system for as long as possible. We are across from Morningside Heights on the Manhattan side. If you go inland here, you have Columbia University, Barnard College, and many other religious and academic institutions. There are two notable structures across from us with a new interloper that I will point out momentarily. You'll notice the bell tower that got the revival style from Riverside Church. Scaffolding is covering a good portion of that tower. That is yet another Rockefeller initiative, Riverside Church. And if you look to the left, that smaller neoclassical cylindrical work featuring ionic columns marching around that central drum and the conical rooftop is Grant's tomb or the mausoleum for Ulysses S. Grant. Ulysses S. Grant was the lead general for the northern side, the Union side, toward the end of the American Civil War. And then he was elected twice as President of the United States. That tall tower behind Riverside Church is a new residential building at Union Theological Seminary. A lot of academic and religious institutions have had to find new sources of revenue, so they sell net ground leases to some of the land on their campuses to private developers who then construct new residential towers. The residential buildings closest to us are along Drive, the curving tree line boulevard with a number of monumental works. The park is Riverside Park. It was Frederick Law Olmsted the name some of you may know, Fred Wilmstead was a co-designer of Central Park that was completed in the early 1870s. After that, he turned to the master plan, both of Riverside Drive as well as the park. You'll notice topping many of these residential buildings are wooden water towers. They are actually actively used today and are an important part of our fresh water storage and delivery process. We have three reservoirs, all of St. Mika York, should be about 200 York plus feet tall in uh, Riverside Church. With one million gallons of water every day. Now, potable water comes into the city primarily through the power of gravity and automatically up to the sixth floor of any building. If a building is taller than that, you usually have an electric water pump in the basement that pumps the water up to the wood water towers. So when you turn your cold water faucet on, you're pulling that water down. There's usually a water heater in the basement as well that pulls down that same potable water, heats it up, and through its own pipes, delivers that hot water to individual residential units. Clearly, watch out for the weight. Is, uh, is a modern system used for new buildings? Is a modern system of water towers used for new skyscrapers? Yes, for new buildings, they will have some type of water tower. Taller buildings may have water towers made of wood or metal at different locations to assure there's enough water pressure. And these wooden towers that we're looking at can, act, can last for a good 30 years or so if they are properly maintained. There are three re reservoirs. You have the original one, then you have still in Delaware watersheds that provide the bulk of the fresh water to New York City. New York City passed climate change legislation in 2019 called the Climate Globalization Act. And one element, an important element, is a 
attacking the biggest offender of pumping greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Great culture. And that is our buildings in New York City that are responsible for 70% of our greenhouse gases. And that legislation will require any building in New York City that is 25,000 square feet and more. That means 50,000 buildings in New York City, such as the residential buildings that we are looking at right now on the Upper West Side, they will have to start in 2024, in some cases, to start reducing their release of greenhouse gases below a certain amount. Buildings that are much more energy efficient may not have to start making changes until 2030, but buildings that fail to adhere to these new regulations will start having to pay penalties. And our new mayor, Eric Adams, is in the process right now of adding specific guidelines to this legislation so buildings know exactly what the requirements are. As the legislation gets tougher over the years to come, some buildings might have to go through major retrofits, creating, for example, building envelopes, the outside of the building that is more airtight, meaning, for example, in the winter, cold air cannot enter in the summer. The, uh, so now we should be around cold air, here. The air conditioning, for example, won't be able to escape outside. And we'll see a big transition in how these buildings are heated. Right now, it's mostly boilers in the basement that keep water, and then the resulting steam is pumped up to those noisy radiators that I've lived with all my life. And when these pre-war buildings were constructed pre-war as in before World War II, somewhere actually before World War I, no one was thinking about energy efficiency. They were in some cases thinking about diseases spreading, so they were happy that even in the winter, when the apartments were just simply too hot from the steam from the boilers, you could open your window all the way up. Now we're thinking about energy efficiency. These buildings not only will have to go through retrofits, they may transition from the natural gas-powered water boilers to heat, what are called heat pumps. Heat pumps operate off electricity, much more energy efficient, and they can actually function as heating and air conditioning units. And as New York State embraces renewable energy sources, the electricity that powers those heat pumps will increasingly come from hydroelectric dams, wind power, and solar power as well. should mention the legislation in New York City that deals with these buildings to reduce greenhouse gases is called Local Law 97. If you're local, you're probably going to see a lot more media coverage of Local Law 97 leading up to the year 2024. Can you tell us a little bit more about Waterline Square? Yeah. Can we wait a moment? Okay, on that? that's okay. So right now we are passing through the neighborhoods of Morningside Heights, Upper West Side, and then soon we're going to see Waterline Square, which is why I asked Doug to talk a little, a little bit about it because it's a huge development too. And we're starting to see the super skinny skyscrapers known as Billionaire's Row. So we see the Central Park Tower, which is the very rectangular building, it looks like a huge toothpick. It's right now the tallest building by roof height in all of New York. And then right next to where we see a sideway. On the left-hand side, we are now across from Riverside South, where we see the single and twin-towered residential units. The park is Riverside Park South. It used to be that the park and the neighborhood were united as a New York Central Railroad Yard. And as with a lot of the transportation infrastructure in New York City, simply no longer needed. So we converted a number of those shoreline properties for example, the Javits, the Convention Center, 
that will pass soon and this neighborhood to the new residential offering that has started construction in the early 1990s. And you'll notice as we come to the right, the southern side of this Riverside South, we're coming up to the last of the developments here, Waterline Square, with the all glass clad residential buildings with the more intriguing silhouette with those angular, angular sloping notch elements with a wonderful park in the midsection. This was designed by a number of well-known architects like Richard Meyer, KPF, so and right. Raphael Vignoli, the Uruguayan architect, who I'll return to in just a moment when we take a look at the super tall towers. But first, we are going to make the transition now from the Upper West Side to Hell's Kitchen or the Clinton neighborhood with Midtown Manhattan further inland. You'll notice right along the shoreline coming into view is this silvery, stainless steel clad, pyramid shaped residential rental building. This is Via 57 West by Bjarke Engels. Bjarke Engels is about 46 years old. He's relatively young and has had major commissions around the world. And if you go back 10, 15 years ago, you would have never imagined high upscale residential offerings on this far west side of Midtown. You'll notice that the wide expanse of Via 57 West is facing due west, so it captures ample sunlight in the afternoon that filters down to that courtyard below through that irregular cutout. If you look up at the northern end of Midtown here, we have an excellent view of those soaring super tall towers known as the Millionaire Row Towers. When we started these tours over a decade ago, none of these towers existed. And way in the background, that white square-shaped tower with the flat roof tower. That is 432 Park Avenue by Raphael Vignoli. The tower that is next in line closer to us is the most slender of these towers. You'll notice it has a series of gentle setbacks on the right side. The crown is quite slender. This is the Steinway Tower because the entrance is the historic Steinway and Santa Piana's uh, showroom or it's 111 West 57th Street by Shop Architects. It's nice seeing cruise ships dock once again here at the Manhattan Passenger Cruise Ship Terminal. During the early part of the pandemic, there were just about zero cruise ships. And then if we look to the right side of Midtown, you can see a collection of spires, black and white, that crown primarily office buildings in Times Square, the 42nd Street area. Much closer to us, this gray-hulled aircraft carrier is the Intrepid. It served the United States in the Pacific during World War II and the Vietnam War. Many of the star planes and fighter jets are on the flight deck. If you're on the bow of the boat outside, you're almost beginning to look down 42nd Street. 42nd Street is immediately to the right of the old Sheridan Hotel building with the light concrete panels and the green tinted windows. Now in the cabin, I'm starting to look down the famous 42nd Street toward the bright now with LED lights of Times Square in the theater district. As we continue along the shoreline, there's a low built multi block structure has stainless steel panels on the sides. And if you look just a block ahead of us at the center on its rooftop, it has glass clad cubes that step down. This entire complex is the Javits Convention Center. Initially from the late 1980s, they built out an entire green rooftop that absorbs rainwater. And on the left side, immediately across from us, they have an urban farm. They even have hydroponics where they grow vegetables and herbs in an enclosed space where they add various nutrients. And the advantage of hydroponics is you 
grow vegetables year round. The glass cladding at the heart of the Jacob, ja Jacob Javits Convention Center was just changed, and now it has prints, these ceramic dots that can be seen by birds. So the Javits Center has done its part to try to minimize the number of birds that are killed here in New York City. We have arrived at Hudson Yards, this mega development with the soaring glass clad office and residential buildings that officially opened right before the pandemic struck. You'll notice along the shoreline, you have 12th Avenue, cars and trucks. Immediately past the shoreline, you can make out intermittent sections of the brown rusted sides of the High Line, the elevated park we discussed earlier, and rising up from the center of Hudson Yards, that brown copper-colored steel structure looks like a honeycomb shape. That is the vessel that consists of 150 interconnected stairwells, a design by the British designer Thomas Heatherwick, who also designed Barry Diller's little island with that undulating shape. That is now the permanent art installation at Hudson Yards. A offering that I love at Hudson Yards that we can't see is the Shed, the Performing Arts Center by Diller, Sculpinio, and Renfro. It's telescopic in design, as in the outer shell can be open and closed in a telescopic manner so that they can reconfigure that space for different types of performances and different sizes of audiences that they're wishing to host. And for our last architectural treat, you'll notice a red horizontal stripe through a low-built building along the shoreline. To the right of that, there's a freestanding, taller, 19-story residential building. You'll notice it has curving, silvery columns that separate each bay of windows. That is the ensuite Sky Garage building, a mouthful. If you own one of those expensive duplexes, you can drive your Tesla or other car into an elevator on the ground floor, bring your car and yourself up to the floor where you have the entrance to your duplex, park, a, park your car, walk a few feet, you are in your the heart, or you are in your $20 million plus duplex in the heart of the West Chelsea neighborhood where we are about to dock right now. And as we prepare to dock, Captain Aaron does ask that everybody grab a seat and remain seated or until all the lines are secured. He will let you know when it's safe to stand up and disembark. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you did a great job. I appreciate it. And while we're at it, why don't we give a hand to Captain Aaron and the crew, Christian and Sean, for all the work they do, looking out for our safety and serving us wonderful drinks. That was amazing. Beautiful views. By the way, are there any architects, landscape architects, engineers, or anybody else who would benefit from continuing education units? Should I bring the form to you? I will do that. Once we dock, I will be the first person to exit. I'll be on top of the pier, happy to answer any questions that you may have. And as you exit, there'll be a tip jar where you can show your appreciation to the captain and crew. Thank you so much once Thank again. You. So everyone, that was an amazing tour. Let me show you a little bit more around the ship. Sorry, no worries. So this was part of the classic Harbor Line. Amazing 
series of tours. They have this in person during Thursdays in November and December, plus a whole host of other different tours. Mika says thanks to Meg, Doug Fox, Classic Harbor Line. Alright, first, uh, hopefully you guys had a great time. Did I give a round of applause to Doug? They did an amazing job. Hello. Hope you guys learned a lot. We're going to have a couple of minutes before we get the last uh, lines on here. So please stay in your seats here. If you did like your, what you enjoyed today, check out our other cruises. We've got lots of great stuff going on here at Classic Harbor Line. We've got a Cocoa and Cow Cruise series that happens during the holidays. We've got... Um, Great brunch cruises, so check our website at www.sail-nyc.com for more information. And you know what? I got inspired, and I came up with a little poem. You know, you people inspire me. And so let me know what you think, all right? Only the wind and waves can tip the boat, but only you can tip the cruise. So if you did have a good time today, show your appreciation. Like Doug said, we'll have a tip jar right at the gate there, and enjoy the last video ride here on the Manhattan. Thanks. Amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> So since everyone's yeah. watching the live stream, feel yeah. free to like press that like button and share this live video. Um, and afterwards, it's going to be posted on Classic Harbor Line's channels. On YouTube, it's Classic Harbor Line. On uh, Facebook, Classic Harbor Line. And also on Instagram, Classic Harbor Line. Thank you. And uh, you can feel free to check them out. I did not have my king of the world moment here. So right now, <laughs> as it's parked. <laughs> I'm king of the world, <laughs> right here, in beautiful Classic Harbor Line. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me over to Classic Harbor Line. If you watch videos, you can go to Urbanist Exploring Cities on YouTube. That's Urbanist Exploring Cities on YouTube. And on TikTok, it's my name, Ariel Vieira. A-R-I-E-L-V-I-E-R-A. -E -E and uh, it was such a blast coming on this tour. So thank you, thank you so much for inviting me over. This was in honor and a remembrance of the 10 year anniversary of Superstorm Sandy, which unfortunately devastated New York 10 years ago, almost exactly this time of year. And we learned plenty of how New York City's waterfront is being prepared against any future storms and any future levels of the sea rising. Check out any Instagrams that are coming up from Classic Harbor Line. So thank you everyone so much for tuning in. I appreciate it. I'm so glad so many people left amazing questions. And a huge round of hearts to Doug Fox, who does a lot of tours here on Classic Harbor Line and his own tours as well all around New York City. Ah, that was so much amazing fun. Right here, one more time, this is the Chelsea Piers. Uh, here you could catch Classic Harbor Line. This is their booth right over here, Pier 62. Pier 62 is very easy to find. It's right by 23rd Street. And right here, we also have the skate park. It is very family friendly too as well. And it is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful ride. Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Keep being awesome and always keep on exploring. As I say on my own channel, check out ClassicHarborLine.com. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.